I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest news from across Ukraine, update on the diplomatic and political news across Europe, and Francis Derny discusses an important article from Rusi's Jack Watling on the state of the war at the start of 2024. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Thursday, the 4th of January one year and 314 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by assistant comment editor Francis Sternley and Brussels correspondent Joe Barnes. Just a quick note to our regular listeners. Our associate editor Dom Nichols is away this week. Don't worry, we haven't dropped him. In his absence, I started by summing up the latest news from Ukraine. Let's actually start more than a thousand miles behind... Russian lines deep in Russia, where Ukrainian saboteurs have blown up a Russian Su-34 fighter jet. Ukraine's military intelligence, that's the HUR, has released a video showing a saboteur setting a Russian fighter jet alight. Citing a source in the HUR, Ukrainska Pravda, a Ukrainian newspaper, reported that the attack took place at the Shagol airfield in Chelyabinsk, an industrial city to the east of the Ural Mountains, in an HUR operation. We can confirm that the enemy aircraft has been completely burnt out, the source was quoted as saying in Ukrainska Pravda. Just um, some context there, Chelyabinsk is just a bit more than 1,000 miles to the east of the easternmost point of the current front line, which is a salient around the city of Siversk in Donetsk. And the alleged Ukrainian attack there would demonstrate, uh, repeatedly demonstrate, in fact, the impressive reach and capabilities of Ukrainian operatives far, far behind the front lines. But back to the front lines in Ukraine, according to the Institute for the Study of War, that's the US-based think tank, Russia has made a confirmed advance near the contested Ukrainian city of Avdivka. Uh, They say that they have geolocated footage showing Moscow's forces pushing back the Ukrainian army there. Just to remind ourselves, Avdivka is a partially encircled industrial city in eastern Ukraine that's been the focus of Russian attacks in recent months in a bid to take a major settlement for the first time since Bakhmut in May. The ISW also said that Russian soldiers have advanced uh, to the southwest city of Don- uh, advanced in the southwest of Donetsk city, and Russian bloggers have also claimed to have advanced near Bakhmut in recent days. But these reports have not yet been confirmed. Away from the front lines, then uh, Russia's overnight attacks on Ukraine were far more muted last night than in recent days. Just three missile attacks and two drones were reported. The worst damage was reported in Kodakhovo, Donetsk, where military governor Vadim Filashkin said Russian rockets destroyed a school, nursery and health centre, but caused, luckily, no casualties. Late on Wednesday, two S-300 missile attacks struck Kharkiv. Governor Ole Snyhubov said there were no deaths or injuries and the only damage was to a residential building where the windows were blown out. And just finally on this, the Ukrainian armed forces also said it shot down two Shahid drones that were launched over the western Khmeinsky region. Uh, there's also been shelling across the lines. Two men have been injured in the Dnitropetrovsk city of Nikopol, reg- regional governor Serhi Lisak has said, uh, both with leg injuries, one serious. A Russian missile strike also on Kropin Yitsky in the central Kirohavrad region has killed one civilian and injured at least others. And we understand that the, uh, the injury toll there is going up. Uh, Away from uh, the frontline updates, shellings and strikes, there's been a very important story. Uh, Russia and Ukraine have exchanged hundreds of prisoners of war in the biggest single release of captives since the start of the full-scale invasion. Ukrainian authorities said that 230 Ukrainian prisoners of war returned home on Wednesday in the first exchange in almost five months. Russia's defence ministry said that 248 Russian servicemen had been freed under the deal sponsored by the United Arab Emirates. The UAE's foreign ministry attributed the successful swap to the, quote, strong friendly relations between the UAE and both the Russian Federation and the Republic of Ukraine, which were supported by sustained calls at the highest levels. Uh, Just to remind ourselves again, the UAE has maintained close economic ties with Moscow, despite Western sanctions. Dmitry Lubinets, Ukraine's human rights ombudsman, said that it was the 49th prisoner exchange during the war. 
Some of the details then on who was released. Um, some of the Ukrainian soldiers had been held since 2022. Among those released were people who'd fought in the milestone battles for Ukraine's Snake Island and also uh, in the siege of Mariupol. Russian officials offered no details on their side of the exchange. Just finally then, before we go to Joe Barnes, uh, Ukraine plans to expand its defence industry by 500% in 2024. This is coming from uh, Ukraine's Prime Minister, Denis Shmihal, who said that the ambitious goal for the current year is a six-fold increase. This means more drones, more shells, more ammunition and armoured vehicles for our military. He added that the industry's arms industry production capacity trebled in 2023, adding drones, shells, ammunition, vehicles, all of which would be its focus. That's the latest then from the strikes, shellings and front lines. Joe, um, what have you been looking at today? Hi, folks. Um, There's a few interesting stories out there, but I'll start with, and you remember us speaking about this recently, um, when Ukraine's largest mobile network, Kyivstar, was basically downed for a few days. And actually, uh, um, the repercussions were quite were great lots of soldiers communicate using their mobile phones um which isn't the wisest but they do um it cut my communications with a few people i speak to in ukraine every day um but there's been some more information out on how russian hackers managed to knock out kiev star um in december so and that's according to uh, a ukrainian spy chief Ilya vituk who is head of cybersecurity at ukraine's sbu security services um he said he was pretty sure the attack on Kyivstar was carried out by Sandworm, which is a Russian military intelligence cyber warfare unit. A group called Sonet Stepok, Sebiok, believed um, by the SBU to be affiliated with Sandworm, said it was responsible for the attack. Uh, Vityuk said the attack wiped out almost everything and was one of the first times a cyber attack had completely destroyed the core of a telecoms operator. He added that the hackers were likely to be able to steal personal information, understand the locations of phones, intercept text messages, and perhaps steal Telegram accounts. Um, this is actually interesting. Back when I was looking at electronic warfare, um, I was looking at how Russia was using and intercepting mobile phone signals that were controlling drones to basically con- to dictate and coordinate counter-battery fire. So it's interesting that that's possibly what the plot was all about, um, sort of getting into mobile networks and stealing information. Um, let's go to um, financial aid. And Denis Shimel, the Ukrainian prime minister, has said Ukraine will need more than £29 billion in Western financial aid in 2024. That's $37 billion. Um, so this year... This year's needs exceed 37 billion, he told a government meeting. We count on regular, stable and timely assistance from partners. He said that the EU, the United States, the International Monetary Fund, Japan, Canada, Britain and the World Bank were Kyiv's main financial supporters. Since the beginning of the war, Ukraine's allies and multilateral organisations have pledged to almost 220 billion pounds, that's 278 billion dollars in aid, of which £121 billion, £153 billion is financial support. Um, You'll know that the EU has a €50 billion package currently delayed because of a Hungarian veto. Uh, EU leaders are going to try and unblock that again on the 1st of February when they meet in Brussels for an emergency summit. But um, that it looks unlikely. Um, We've reported on the EU working on a sort of a £20 billion workaround which will um, so there's twenty about or what is it about seventeen billion pounds, um, which they hope to work on, which will be basically provide Ukraine with that money this year, um, while the fifty billion is over four years, um, and that's if Hungary continues to oppose the fifty billion. So yeah, interesting times. So meanwhile, Polish farmers have resumed their blockade of the Medyka. Border crossing with Ukraine, that's the largest sort of border crossing, most active. Um, that's also been blockaded by truckers. The, so farmers are demanding new Prime Minister Donald Tusk give them a signed assurance that he will bring in increased corn subsidies and lower taxes. So a lot of the farmers are upset with the fact that basically Ukrainian grains and other products are given free entrance into the EU, which often don't move beyond Poland. Um, or the border countries because it's basically so costly to um, to transport and basically it's cheaper than 
domestically made stuff in the EU. Um, so their blockade started in November. It was lifted on December 24th after a meeting with Agricultural Minister Shizlaw Sikerskili, sorry for his pronunciation, in which um, he promised to accept their demands, but it looks like that protest has basically restarted. Um, so we have some news back in uh, in Ukraine, in the Russian-held city of Melitopol. Um, Russia has sent 60,000 of its own citizens to live in occupied Melitopol, uh, the city's exiled mayor said. So Ivan Fedorov said 50% of the current residents in the city are now Russian because of policies which he said were intensively changing the ethnic composition of the city. Initially, they impoverished the residents. So this is Ivan Fedorov writing on Telegram. Now, through the Occupation Employment Centre, they offer work in Russia for the unemployed. Meanwhile, they import uh, tourists using sort of bunny quotations from the Russian Federation to temporary occupied territories. So Fedorov added, when Melitopol residents go out in the street, they don't see familiar faces. The There are subhumans from Russia all around. So it's part of the sort of the idea of Russifying occupied territories. Melitopol has been occupied literally since the start of the start of the full-scale invasion in 2020. Lots of stories often come out of how residents are given or forced to take up Russian passports, take Russian lessons, Russian mandated education, etc. etc. Okay, um also in Ukraine, a Ukrainian court has sentenced a man who ran a separatist torture chamber in occupied Donetsk to 15 years in prison. Uh, so the man who is named as Denis Kulovsky headed the is <laughs> sorry again pronunciation is a is a Shia jail at a factory in Donetsk City between 2015 and 2018. Journalists, activists, and prisoners of war were detained and tortured at the facility. He was arrested in Kiev in November 21 and has since been convicted of terrorism, cruel treatment of prisoners and participation in an illegal armed group. That would probably be the uh, Donetsk separatist and Donetsk People's Republic. Um, the man must also pay £8,300 in damages and £1,980 in civil claims brought by two former prisoners. It's sort of interesting how Ukraine is looking to challenge people that are involved in the separatist movements that sort of date back to the 2014 uh, invasion of the Donbass area. Um, and then also, just one last update from from the Russian energy giant Gazprom, which has announced a new daily record for the amount of gas supplied to China. And that says Vladimir Putin basically seeks to prop up his wartime economy. The so Gazprom, the state-controlled uh, energy giant has not put a figure on the daily supplied amount, uh, but said exports for 2023 via the, the power of Siberia pipeline amounted to 22.7 billion cubic meters, which is also a record. Uh, this was about 1.5 times more than the 15.4 billion cubic uh, centimeters or cubic meters, sorry, supplied in 2022. For comparison, the UK consumes about 76 billion cubic meters of gas per year. Russia is basically exporting a lot to China to make up for basically a loss of sales in Europe and the West. Um, what's interesting is often these exports are sold at a sort of a lower rate. So actually it benefits China to basically consume Russian gas at a cheaper rate that it, it's normally sold at. So yeah, all of the... Um, all of the ways Russia is looking to circumvent sanctions um, put on it by Europe and other Western governments for the US, UK, et cetera, et cetera. Um, by, yeah, by looking for new markets abroad and basically, yeah, moving the product elsewhere rather than its traditional markets over the last 20, 30, 40 years. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Joe, for all of that. Francis, can I come to you? Um, the last few days, you've been taking a bit more of a removed analytical approach to the news, standing back slightly and giving your thoughts on the more general strategic situation, military situation, etc. Um, what have you been looking at for us today? Well, yes, thank you, David. As you say, I started this process of trying to summarise the strategic picture by reflecting on the respective positions of the core participants, most significantly Zelensky and Putin, yesterday as we begin 2024. So I recommend listening to that if you want to hear the political positioning 
of the Ukrainian and Russian presidents at this moment. But today I want to look more deeply at the military situation, zooming out and considering the battlefields themselves in the abstract. And a helpful starting point is an excellent new piece by Jack Watling, Senior Research Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute in Foreign Affairs, which begins by critiquing the narrative that has formed in recent months in a similar manner that Professor Timothy Snyder did in our interview with him last year. So Mr Watling writes, since the failure of offensives in 2023 by both Ukraine and Russia, a narrative is coalescing that the war in Ukraine has reached a stalemate. The perception of an indefinite but static conflict is causing a sense of fatigue in the capitals of Ukraine's partners. This perception, however, is deeply flawed. Both Moscow and Kyiv are in a race to rebuild offensive combat power. While the first half of 2024 may bring few changes in control of Ukrainian territory, the material, personal training and casualties that each side accrues in the next few months will determine the long-term trajectory of this conflict. The West, in fact, faces a crucial choice right now. Support Ukraine so that its leaders can defend their territory and prepare for a 2025 offensive or cede an irrecoverable advantage to Russia. He goes on. Uncertainty about the long term provision of aid to Ukraine risks not only giving Russia advantages on the battlefield, but also emboldening Moscow further. What the US and Europe do over the next six months will determine one of two futures. In one, Ukraine can build up its forces to renew offensive operations and degrade Russian military strength to the degree that Kyiv can enter negotiations with the leverage to impose a lasting peace. In the other, a shortage of supplies and trained personnel will mire Ukraine in an attritional struggle that will leave it exhausted and facing eventual subjugation. Ukraine's international partners must remember that the first outcome is desirable, not only to Ukrainians. It is necessary to protect the international norm that states do not change their borders by force. A mobilised and emboldened Russia would pose a sustained threat to NATO, requiring the US to indefinitely underwrite deterrence in Europe. That would constrain the US's capability to project force in the Indo-Pacific and substantially increase the danger of conflict over Taiwan. Now, just to break momentarily from Mr Watling's piece, it is worth recalling what Poland said back in December, namely that unless Russia is checked now, its grand mobilisation would enable it to threaten NATO's eastern flank within three years. And I know some people listen to that and think, but Russia would never break Article 5, so what difference does it make? And whilst I agree that's logical, vitally, I think the implications of a fully mobilised threatening Russia for worldwide security more generally is underappreciated. And that's what I think Mr. Watling is getting at. It would necessitate enormous resources to be deployed in Eastern Europe to act as a deterrent. Resources which may be more vital in the Indo-Pacific or the Middle East if things were to escalate there over the coming year or two. So a stronger Russia is not in NATO's interests. But back to Jack Watling. If the Ukrainian military's 2023 offensive had gone according to plan, its forces would have punched through Russia's so-called Sorovkian line in Zaporizhia and liberated Melitopol, severing the roads connecting Russia to Crimea. Combined with Ukrainian naval operations, that would have put Crimea under siege. This objective was ambitious but achievable. The foremost reason it failed was that the Ukrainian units assigned to lead the offensive had insufficient time to train and prepare. Ukrainian personnel also had too little opportunity to train collectively. The number of troops deployed is not the only thing that matters in war. The potency of an army's manpower is a function of how well small units coordinate, even while dispersed across a broad area. Ukraine's geography demands especially skilled coordination because tree lines prevent units from being able to see each other. The threat of artillery further drives dispersion so that companies are often spread over nearly two miles of front. The terrain of Zaporizhia particularly encourages commanders to fight two miles of front and and to fight in isolated companies. In this geographic context, a a capacity to synchronise activity beyond each unit's line of sight is needed so units can support one another and exploit each other's gains. 
During the 2023 offensive, Ukrainian operations were largely fought by pairs of companies under the close management of an understaffed brigade command post. The result was that Ukrainian soldiers often succeeded in taking enemy positions, but were rarely able to exploit the breaches they made or to quickly reinforce their gains. Instead, they had to stop and plan, giving Russian forces time to reset. Now, again, just as an aside, this tallies with our interviews with people on the podcast over the last year who were quite critical of the NATO provided training and some of the gaps that it left, which Mr. Watling writes about. But going back to him, better training would not diminish Kyiv's need for materiel. The Ukrainian military is likely to face significant equipment shortages over the coming year. At the height of its 2023 offensive, Ukraine was firing up to 7,000 artillery rounds per day, accounting up to 80% of Russia's combat losses. By the end of 2023, however, Ukrainian forces were firing closer to 2,000 rounds per day. Russia's artillery capability, meanwhile, has turned a corner, with Russian forces now firing up to around 10,000 rounds per day. Unless Ukraine can again create localised conditions of artillery superiority, many new offensive operations will result in unsustainable losses of Ukrainian troops. The challenge for Ukraine is that even while it maintains a defensive posture, it must continue to mount localised offensives. If Russia sustains fewer losses, the capabilities of its forces in the field will improve. Moscow would also be able to divert experienced troops to train recruits, potentially allowing it to open new offensive axes in the second half of 2024. Russian forces could also concentrate on sectors where they can establish a more favourable battlefield geometry and inflict heavier losses on Ukraine. If Ukraine leaves large sanctions of the front quiet, Russian forces may also be able to significantly expand their fortifications, making any future Ukrainian offensive operations harder to carry out. Even while it holds a defensive posture, the Ukrainian military must seek to maximise Russia's rate of attrition. A realistic plan would involve resourcing Kyiv to maintain a defensive posture throughout most of 2024, while units are trained and equipped to mount offensive operations in 2025. Beyond the certainty this plan would offer Ukraine generals, it would also signal to the Kremlin that it cannot count on winning a years-long war of attrition against an increasingly thinly resourced Ukraine. A US commitment to supporting Ukraine through 2024 would also shift European allies' incentives towards investing more deeply in increasing the capacity of their weapons industries, reducing the burden on the US through 2025. Mr. Watling concludes. Some leaders in Western capitals now argue that it is time to negotiate an end to the war in Ukraine. This line of thinking, however, misses both the extent of Russia's goals and what the Kremlin would realistically offer. Moscow is not interested in simply seizing some Ukrainian territory. Putin has repeatedly stated that he wants to change the logic of the international system. The US and its allies face a choice. They can either make an immediate plan to bolster the training they provide to the Ukrainian military, clarify to their publics and to Ukraine that the October 2024 deadline to liberate territory must be extended and underwrite Ukraine's material needs through 2025, or they can continue to falsely believe the war is in a stalemate, dithering and ceding the advantage to Russia. This would be a terrible mistake. In addition to expanding its partnerships to Africa, Russia is strengthening its collaboration with China, Iran and North Korea. And if a loss in Ukraine ends up demonstrating that the West cannot meet a single challenge to the world's security architecture, its adversaries will hardly believe it can deal with multiple crises at once. Now, there is more detail, David, in the original piece, which we'll include in the description for the episode. But that's the essence of it. Interestingly, perhaps in contrast to some analysts, including Commander Zeluzhny himself, it doesn't give extensive emphasis on the importance of new weaponry, such as jets and missiles, but rather it focuses on those wider logistical and political concerns. I think that's one for us all to ponder in the weeks and months ahead. 
Thanks so much, Francis. And as, as you said, it's a really great piece there from Jack Watling, and we will include it in the show notes. So do go and look at the whole thing there. Um, Francis, you speak about the importance of the US defence posture there. And I see Ukraine's, Ukraine's foreign minister has made some interesting remarks about the prospects of a Trump victory. What did he say and what do you read into it? Sure, I'll just be very brief. So Dmitry Kuleba has insisted that the country can work with Donald Trump if he becomes the next American president. So I'll quote from him. He says, Trump is known for his, I would say, ultra charismatic actions, his reputation and his phrases. But who sold the first American weapon to Ukraine? President Trump sent us javelins. Who launched the programme of free delivery of the first naval vessels, the Island and Mark VI boats to Ukraine? Trump, who fought the Nord Stream 2 project and imposed sanctions on the well-known but already forgotten Fortuna ship that laid this pipeline. Trump, that's why Trump is a person you can work with. You just need to know how to work with him. I was speculating last year on the podcast that we might start seeing the Ukrainians making overtures to that they would be able to work with with Trump. They have little choice after all. But the framing of it is interesting, I think, as it tallies with what a lot of Ukrainians do say privately, that they actually owe more to Donald Trump than many in the West understand. Perhaps Kuliba is right. And if the Ukrainians play to Mr. Trump's ego, they might well be able to talk him round or at least to a more favourable Ukrainian position. There is certainly more extensive bipartisan support than one might expect in the wider Republican Party fraternity, something we've discussed at length following our trip to the United States back in September. But of course, it would be far from an ideal circumstance for Key for all of the reasons previously discussed. But I do think the timing of this is quite interesting, David, as we start 2024. Thank you very much, Francis and Joe. Let's move to our final thoughts then. Uh, Joe Barnes, would you like to go first? Yeah, um, I just want to look at a interesting sort of story that it's a few days old now but I, I i kind of overlooked it that um and it's all part of this idea where we're talking about this idea that europe has to do more to bolster its defense industrial capacities uh build more shelves to not only fuel ukraine's defense and offensives but also to basically replenish dwindled stockpiles and um it looks like denmark is uh trying to make that um, change. It's um, basically reversed a closure of an old ammunition factory uh, called the Krutzen, Krint, which basically translates to gunpowder. Um, and I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that, where almost factories in Europe take over this American style of model where they are f- run by private contractors but essentially funded by the government in order to uh, to um, to yeah to get them back up and running and producing ammunition when they haven't been doing so for sometimes for a decades um, and actually that's one thing in Jack Watlin's piece that I was reading yesterday it was quite interesting he said look while lots of people uh, mainly Ukraine say look this is about defending Europe um, by giving us weapons actually. This is a great way of bringing in tax receipts because all of these goods and items that are bought, um, whether they're sold to Ukraine or just basically just getting economies going after what has been a pretty torrid time with COVID, then obviously the inflationary pressures of the war in Ukraine, energy crunches, etc. So it's um, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of this, and it's probably something that I'm going to actually start looking at more about what factories um, across Europe could be opening up and uh, producing 155 shells. Uh, Jack Watlin spoke about the need for, um, I think he said it was just shy of 2,000 artillery barrels a year that uh, Ukraine will need to carry on its defensive duties. So, yeah, it's interesting to see where where is this going to come from, what factories are going to be opening up. But Denmark seems to be getting off the starting line already in Europe. Thank you very much, Joe. Francis, would you like to close today's episode? Thanks, David. We were reflecting on Zelensky's evolving political position yesterday and a bit today. And I wanted to point people to a long read in our paper called I Spent a Year with Zelensky and Saw How His Personality Transformed, which is an extract from the new book by Simon Schuster analysing the president. 
It's very revealing and rich with telling anecdotes, such as when in spring 2022, the 55th day of the Russian invasion, Zelensky asked when Schuster planned to finish his book about him. And Schuster told him that his aim would be to capture the first year of the war and then publish. And apparently Zelensky's face fell and he said, you think the war will not be over in a year? And it's especially good on the reactions of Zelensky at key moments such as the very beginning of the war when he was shocked but absolutely resolved to fight and in the president's recognition of key flashpoints such as the battle for the airport that we've discussed many times on the podcast and the need to show strength to the world in those critical opening months of the full-scale invasion. The president's response caught some aides by respite, by surprise, writes Schuster. They'd never seen him in such a rage. He gave the harshest possible orders, recalled one. Show no mercy. Use all available weapons to wipe out every Russian thing at the airport. Meanwhile, an emergency summit of European leaders was taking place to determine what punishment Russia deserved. The leaders of Germany, Austria and Hungary, among others, didn't want to cut ties with the Russian banking system. For a while, their debate went in circles. Then Zelensky dialed in. Pale and tired, with the early stubble of his wartime beard beginning to show, the president did not have much faith in his allies to save him, and the pessimism showed. This may be the last time you see me alive, Zelensky told them. Here was the president of a European democracy, holed up in a bunker, preparing to face his death and the subjugation of his country. It changed everything. Now, the article also reveals the practicalities of day-to-day life leading a country at war. Evidently, Zelensky didn't take good care of himself initially, surviving for days on chocolate and very little sleep. I've never seen a human in that condition, one of his aides tells Schuster. There's also more on the tensions between the president's office and the commander, something that, as we discussed yesterday, I think we're going to be paying a lot more attention to over the coming weeks. Interestingly, Zelensky reads a lot of Churchill, something we knew, but actually, I hadn't read this before, idolises other figures from that era even more, such as George Orwell and Charlie Chaplin. So artists who articulated what was at stake in a clear, concise and passionate way. Something, of course, which Zelensky himself is known for and particularly talented at, I think it's fair to say. So to conclude, and I think it's quite interesting given that thought there, Schuster writes, stubborn, confident, vengeful, impolitic, brave to the point of recklessness and unsparing towards those who stood in his way. Zelensky channeled the anger and resilience of his people and expressed it with purpose to the world. It was the showmanship he honed over more than 20 years as an actor that made Zelensky so effective in fighting this war. So a very interesting, revealing read. As I say, the link will go in the description to that. And I highly recommend it as a piece to offer a little bit more fleshing out of some of the key episodes of the war so far, Zelensky's reactions to them, as well as some insights into the personality of the president of Ukraine and how it's changed over the course of almost two years of full-scale war. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, a world affairs newsletter which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, 
We are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Charles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.